everyone's going to uh, populate with the attendees here. There we go. Hey, everyone. We're just going to wait while people virtually file in here, uh, and we'll get started in a, uh, a couple of moments. Excellent. Awesome. Well, well while we're waiting um, for everyone else to file in, I have a couple of announcements, so we'll get started. Uh, first, I want to say hello and thank you everyone for coming. My name is Matt Kalaski, and I am the manager of public programs here at the Michener. And I'm really excited that you're all joining us for our Foodie Friday. I hope you're having a very foodalicious Friday, relaxing, <laughs> full of good vibes. Uh, I have a, like I said, I have a couple quick announcements, and then we'll get right to our program, okay? First, uh, as we all get used to attending virtual events, the Michener wants to make sure that we are providing you with the best possible online experience. Uh, if you have a moment after today's event, we ask that you consider completing our quick virtual program survey. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in our chat box for you to check out right now. Next, I want to invite you to some of our upcoming events, which we have. They're fun, creative, and educational, all of which you can enjoy from the comfort of your home. Uh, our, our tagline for these are sweatpants encouraged, showering is optional. Uh, first, next Wednesday, May 20th at 2 p.m., we have our Art of Stillness. Uh, this is a free program offered every Wednesday at the museum, and it's where you can immerse yourself in a single work with careful observation. Hosted via Zoom and led by our trained docents, this highly interactive virtual experience is designed to create a deep personal connection between you and an art piece. It's a time to relax, contemplate, and share your responses and enjoy. I'll, you can register for this event. Like I said, it's free, but you do have to register. You can do that. Next event we have coming up is Ladies Night in Collage Creations. This is Friday, May 22nd at 6.30 p.m. You can grab your computer, your smartphone, or mobile device and join Andrea Thompson, our arts education manager, for a night of fun, relaxing art making as we put a twist on our traditional and very popular Ladies Night Out. Uh, students will use materials they have gathered to create at least one collage while socializing with other students and with Andrea. It's a really fun night. We did a test one at the museum a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you're looking for something to do on Friday, May 22nd, I suggest you grab some friends and join us. Next, we know that now more than ever, the museum and the arts are our window onto a wider world. And all of us at the Michener are, again, thrilled that you're joining us today. Uh, if you like what you see and you are able to do so, I encourage you to make a donation to our annual fund. Uh, every contribution, big or small, makes a huge difference in our ability to continue to present programming as well as we stay socially distant together. You can do that through this link that I'm going to post right now. Lastly, I want you to know that while the Michener is temporarily closed, you can still experience our museum from home. We've collected all of our online resources for adults, kids, students, and teachers in one place on our website. Uh, it's a huge cache of resources, definitely worth dipping into on a rainy afternoon. And here's this link. And now lastly, I wanted to go over a few features of this Zoom webinar that we are in right now. Because this is a webinar, uh, only myself and the speakers will be live with video and sound. Uh, so all of you participating at home as attendees, just sit back, relax. You can vacuum, make as much noise as you want. Um, just like TV, we won't be able to see or hear you. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't interact uh, at the bottom 
of your Zoom screens, you should see several icons. Uh, if you click on that chat button, you should see, oh, let's see, this way, you should see this way, uh, an icon that will allow you to chat with other participants and the speaker. Uh, there's also a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can post questions for uh, our speaker today. If you have specific questions, I would highly encourage you to put them in that Q&A. Sometimes uh, the chat can run long and the questions can get lost. So if you have a question for Dr. Richards, please uh, put it in that Q&A function. Uh, now, uh, to welcome Dr. Richards today, uh, I thought instead of politely clapping, we can have everyone in their chat function right on the side here, type in their favorite type of ice cream. Mm, mine is uh, Rocky Road, of course. So I'm gonna put that in there. And while we're all uh, typing in our favorite type of ice cream, I will introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Bruce Richards is an associate professor of animal science at Delaware Valley University. He completed his PhD in animal nutrition at the University of Illinois and his MS and BS at Utah State University. Dr. Richards grew up on a dairy farm in Utah, and now he and his wife, Brittany, have five children. Please join me welcoming Dr. Richards. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for being here, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, Matt mentioned that uh, we'll have a chance for you to for some Q&A questions and answers later, but I am going to start, be, I, being a professor, it's just natural, uh, that we're gonna start with a pop quiz. So I'm going to put some questions here in the chat. Whoops, that didn't work. Just a second. Oh no, they're there. It did work. Just one second, sorry. came up showing me the very end of my last question, so I didn't think it worked. There we go. So there's your uh, pop quiz. I answer as many as you can. Uh, if you don't know the answer, that's fine. Uh, hopefully we'll clarify some of these for you today. Uh, when you type your answer, if you just want to put the number of the question next to your answer, uh, then we'll know which one it is. All right, while you're working on that, we're going to do a share screen and uh, show you uh, the presentation. All right. There we go. Uh, so again, the questions uh, for our pop quiz. Uh, what is the difference between a pig and a cow stomach? Let's see how many of you know that? Number two, how many stomachs does a cow have? Number three, what is an example of a monogastric animal? Number four, what is an example of a ruminant animal? And number five, what would happen if you ate nothing but grass and hay? So we'll come back to those in a few minutes, see how you did on your quiz. Uh, Matt already mentioned me a little bit, I forgot how much I already told him. Uh, so I put a couple introductory slides in here while you do your pop quiz. Uh, as he said, I grew up on a Jersey farm out in Utah. Uh, we milked about 300 jerseys uh, at one point. Uh, we had went through different sizes of the farm. Uh, this is a picture of me with my brother Blake and my cousin Bill. Uh, as he mentioned, I went to Utah State University for my bachelor's and my master's degrees. Uh, as you can see from these pictures, it's uh, located in the, in the middle of the mountains uh, in Logan, Utah. Had a wonderful time there. Had a great time going up and hiking in those mountains and jumping in the lake and uh, doing things like that. Then I traded in the mountains for corn and soybeans and I went to the University of Illinois for my PhD uh, where I researched methods to prevent fatty liver in dairy cows. And then I came here uh, to Delaware Valley University. I've been teaching here for nine years. I teach animal nutrition, Spanish for agriculture, and I coach the Dairy Challenge, Dairy Challenge team and advise the Dairy Society. And as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, my wife and I have five children, Eliza, Zabian, Hazel, Ezekiel, and Kenzie. They're outside playing right now, so hopefully they stay outside playing for an hour. We'll see how that works. All right, 
now I'm going to stop share and come here and look at the uh, comments and see uh, if anybody has any answers. I'm not seeing any answers, so I don't know if that means that uh, you don't know. Just a sec. Or if it means I need to refresh. No. Okay, here we go. So, number one, we have somebody saying cow stomachs are bigger. We have somebody saying cows have three stomachs. So, this is good. You're all going to learn something today. So, that's it's going to be a good day because you're going to learn something. Uh, Mr. Brown, who teaches in our department, always says that to his students. If it's a good day, it's a good day if you learn something. And humans are an example of a monogastric. So, that's great. All right, and we have, oh, one of my students that joined us. Hi, Cassie. Uh, you better know all of these. Uh, so cows are ruminants while pigs are monogastric, and that is correct as well. All right, we're gonna come back here to share screen and uh, get back on our way. Oh, we were down, at the, oh, that's okay. All right. So, our pop quiz, what is the difference between a pig and a cow stomach? Uh, a pig, uh, as, you, as uh, no, question number three mentions, is a monogastric or a simple stomach. So, a pig has uh, one stomach compartment like a human, very much like a human stomach. As somebody mentioned that a pig, uh, that humans are also monogastric, that is correct. Uh, so, a pig is a simple stomached animal, a cow, uh, well, let's jump down to question two, it says how many stomachs does a cow have? The correct answer to that question is that a cow has one stomach with four compartments. So a lot of times there's a misnomer out there that cows have four stomachs. Cows have one stomach with four compartments, and we'll mention those uh, more here in just a minute. Uh, monogastrics, the simple stomachs include uh, pigs, horses are a simple stomach, uh, humans, the primates, monkeys have simple stomachs, carnivores, cats, dogs, uh, all have simple one stomach uh, animals, simple stomached animals. Uh, ruminants uh, would include uh, cows, sheep, deer, uh, giraffes are also ruminants, interestingly enough. Uh, antelope, elk, moose, all of those type of animals uh, are ruminants with four stomach compartments. I'll mention briefly camels and llamas are what we call pseudo-ruminants. They have three stomach compartments. That's getting a little bit off of our topic for today. But anyway, some interesting things for you to, that free of charge, there's no additional cost for, for those extra bits of information, all right? And then the last question, what would happen if you ate nothing but grass and hay? The answer is that you would probably starve to death. And we'll talk more about why that is but you would be regular. You would get plenty of fiber and uh, your digestive tract would work <laughs> normally, uh, but you would probably not get any energy from it. So uh, a little bit of back background on my interest in this topic. As I mentioned, uh, I did my PhD at the University of Illinois. Uh, while I was there kind of as a stress reliever and to get some exercise, I took up running uh, with one of my neighbors, Jason was his name. Jason was an architect major. And uh, so uh, as we ran, we did a lot of talking. We talked about everything. And uh, one of the things we started talking about uh, was the environment. Uh, interesting point about Jason is Jason was, at the time while he was in graduate school, he was building a solar house uh, for the University of Illinois to compete in a competition held in Washington, DC for solar houses. And so he was interested in, uh, the environment and uh, so one of the questions he had for me is what was the environmental impact of dairy products and of meat products and so that's had because of our conversation I did a seminar actually as a graduate student on uh, animal protein in the environment and some of the slides you'll see today come from that seminar uh, some of them have been shared with me uh, from some of my colleagues over the last few years and uh, some of them I made last night uh, in preparation for this. Uh, so we're first going to talk a little bit more about comparing a cow to a pig stomach or a ruminant to a monogastric. And, and I do this not just because I'm a nutrition professor and this is what I like to talk about, but I think it's important as we talk about the environment and these effects of animals that you understand a little bit about their nutrition and their anatomy. Uh, then what will I say we'll mention some more about the cow stomach. 
Uh, then we'll talk about some typical feeds that we feed to our animals. Then we'll get into the estimates of greenhouse gases in the United States, and then talk about some advancements that have been made in sustainable animal protein production over the last several years. Uh, so this is a simple uh, picture of the digestive simple digestive tract, excuse me, of a pig. Uh, you can see here uh, we have a uh, simple stomach with one compartment here, intestines similar to a human with the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And then we get into the cecum, uh, colon, and large intestine uh, part of the pig. We contrast that with a cow uh, that has a multi-compartment stomach with uh, the rumen, uh, which is the largest compartment, the reticulum that sits right in front of it, the omasum here, and the abomasum kind of sits under the, the rumen. And then they get into the small intestine and the large intestine similar to other species. Mm, that's not what I intended to happen, sorry. There we go. Uh, so there's uh, four compartments in the ruminant stomach. The rumen is the largest. Uh, it's interesting to look at these pictures from the lining of each of the compartments, at least I think it's interesting. Uh, you can see the rumen has papillae, uh, which are finger-like projections that increase surface area for absorption. We have the reticulum here uh, that uh, kind of has the appearance of honeycomb. Oftentimes it's called the honeycomb. Uh, the reticulum helps with trapping foreign objects. Our ruminants tend to be non-selective in uh, what they consume. And so uh, the reticulum uh, helps take out those, some of those foreign things that they really shouldn't be eating and holds them in place. The omasum is uh, many layers here. It's responsible for water absorption. And then we get to the abomasum, which is what we call the true stomach. It's gonna be the compartment that's most like uh, the stomach of a human or a pig. All right. Uh, I've spent probably enough time talking about this. So we'll just mention the rumen uh, as a large uh, fermentation vat. Our cows and our other ruminants, they live in a symbiotic relationship with uh, the microbes that live in their rumen, the large uh, fermentation vat. Uh, a number of different microbes in there. Uh, we have bacteria, protozoa, and fungi uh, that all live there, and they break down uh, the food for the ruminant. So microbes produce cellulase, which is the enzyme which can break down the beta one for bonds, which forms cellulose. I don't know if any of you listened to Dr. Langston this afternoon. Uh, she was a couple hours ago, she did a, a chemistry presentation for actually it was more uh, geared towards students. My children joined in. Anyway, she's in the chemistry department. She could talk to you more about uh, beta one for bonds and alpha one for bonds. Uh, but anyway, uh, cellulose is made up of glucose just like starch is made up of glucose. The difference between starch and cellulose is that starch is made up of glucose that's bound together in alpha-1-4 bonds and alpha-1-6 bonds. The glucose in cellulose is bound in beta-1-4 bonds. And you and I and our animals do not produce the enzymes to break down those beta-1-4 bonds. That's why I said earlier that if you ate only grass and hay, you would probably starve to death because you don't produce cellulase to break down that glucose that makes the cellulose and be able to break it down and digest it. Our animals don't produce it either, but inside of our ruminants, they uh, have these uh, microbes that do produce cellulase and the microbes actually break down this cellulose into glucose. Uh, we'll come back to that later. I think we'll leave that there for now. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention on this slide is that uh, Actually, those microbes break down the feed to get glucose, not because they like cows and they want to go out and do good for cows. They do it for their own selfish reasons. They actually use the glucose that they harvest from the feed, and then it's their waste product, which is the volatile fatty acids, which the cow and the other ruminants can then use as their source of energy. Uh, those uh, volatile fatty acids are acetate, propionate, and butyrate, and we're gonna come back and mention these later. It turns out that these turn out to be pretty important when we're talking about uh, the environmental impact of, uh, of ruminants and particularly cows, since that's uh, the ruminant that we tend to use most uh, in the world for meat and milk production. 
Uh, let me rephrase what I just said. I, mm, no, I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's a lot of monogastric animals such as swine that sh and of course poultry used for meat production as well is, is why I hesitate to rephrase what I said. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about that in a minute. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to mention briefly uh, is that some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, Dr. Richard, you said that a horse was also a monogastric, but uh, those neighbors of mine or even yourself might have a horse and it eats a lot of grass and hay. Uh, why, why does the horse eat so much grass and hay if it's not a ruminant? The answer is that it is a modified, it has a uh, increased capacity for hindgut fermentation. So you have a large intestine and uh, pigs have a large intestine, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, capacity for fermentation in that large intestine. Horses have a highly saculated large intestine, including the cecum and the colon, and so that in allows them to ferment feeds. There's also bacteria in that large intestine that are gonna break down the forages and make it so they can utilize uh, forages. Anyway, we will move on to uh, feed ingredients. Uh, and we'll come back and mention some of these things from the stomachs later on. Uh, so these feeds are uh, some common feeds we use at the Del Val Dairy. Uh, this is a picture of some alfalfa hay. It's not great quality alfalfa hay, but uh, it's what we have this year. Uh, alfalfa is gonna be a source of fiber uh, for the cows. It also provides a little bit of protein to them. Corn silage, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with corn silage, corn silage is the whole stock of corn uh, that's been chopped up for the animals. Uh, it includes the corn kernels are still on it, the corn cobs, the stalks, the leaves. And so this provides forage, another source of fiber for the cows, uh, but also energy in the form of corn as well. We also do feed high moisture or whole corn. Uh, if we were to feed the corn in this form that you see in the picture, uh, to the cows, then a lot of it would pass through their digestive tract and end up in the manure. So we grind our feet, our corn down into a nice uh, fine powder that it makes it highly digestible. And as we mentioned, uh, a lot of that actually, the, the, the microbes in the rumen are gonna be the ones that actually use a lot of that energy. And then they're gonna produce the volatile fatty acids as a source of energy to the cows. Here's soybean meal. Soybean meal is an important soy source of protein. I have a picture of cottonseed here. Uh, this represents a number of different byproduct feeds that we tend to use in dairy diets uh, throughout the country. Of course, this is a regional thing. Cottonseed, of course, comes from the South. Uh, a couple years ago, I was out in California with some students and we visited dairy farms uh, where they were feeding almond holes uh, in their diets. Uh, citrus pulp uh, was another uh, byproduct feed we see, saw. Uh, there are dairies here in Pennsylvania that feed waste from the Hershey factory uh, to their dairy cows. Uh, if, I, if that were me, I might be tempted to eat some of the cow feed myself, uh, but I don't know if they do that or not. Uh, but anyway, uh, what the, the point is that there's a lot of feeds that we feed to our animals that would otherwise be put into a landfill or be wasted and not utilized. We feed a lot of byproduct feeds. More about that to come. And then this uh, represents our mineral and vitamin mix. Uh, this, this has minerals and vitamins. It's also got some soybean in it and uh, also some fat in it. Uh, Mr. Mayer, who manages the Del Val Dairy Farm, has figured out that if he mixes more ingredients together, then that's only one large ingredient that the students have to add uh, to the mixer wagon. And so he gets less error by mixing multiple, having the meal mix multiple feeds together and coming together as all one package. The reason I show this picture is again to demonstrate the minerals and vitamins uh, that we feed to our dairy cows. All these feeds are mixed together into a giant mixer wagon and uh, produce uh, what we call a total mixed ration. Uh, cows are kind of like children. If they were left to their own devices, they would eat the goodies and leave the vegetables behind. Uh, the fibrous feeds are, more, are what I compare to the vegetables and the grain or the corn is kind of like the goodies that, that has the energy in it and that's what they'd want to select out. Using the mixer wagon, we mix all these feeds together so that every bite that the cow takes is a diet that's balanced to meet their nutrient requirements and, and help them to support production of large quantities of milk. All right, that's the nutrition part of the lecture. I, had to get that out of me. 
Uh, and, but I, like I say, I think it will be important for our discussion as we get into the environmental impact of uh, producing meat and milk. Uh, so a number of years ago, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization published an article in which they claimed uh, that 18% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gases came from livestock. An interesting point about this article that they published is that they called for an intensification of livestock production and said that that would be essential uh, to mitigate the environmental impact of, of animal production for food. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues or uh, acquaintances, Frank Mifflinger, he works at UC Davis and uh, he's an environmentalist. He looks at, does a lot of research on the environmental impact of uh, animal production, meat and milk production. And uh, he looked at the article from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and he said, uh, no, you did this wrong. Uh, when they did the, the research and came up with the 18% number, uh, they did a complete life cycle assessment of meat production or milk production, looking at cradle to grave, meaning they looked at all the environmental impact out from when the calf was born, right? and they compared that to a snapshot of transportation, basically one day of uh, uh, greenhouse gases from, from a car. And so they were not comparing apples to apples. Uh, they weren't even probably comparing apples to oranges. They were comparing a, a complete life cycle assessment of animals to a one day snapshot of a car, which was totally wrong. And he actually wrote an article about it and told the FAO about their mistake. And they actually recognized their mistake, said, yeah, you're right, we did this totally wrong. Uh, but unfortunately that, admission didn't get the same public attention that the 18% number had gotten previously. Uh, and actually the FAO admired Mifflinger's work so much that he actually sits on a board of uh, advisors, I think they call it. He, he works with the FAO now, they, they hired him to work for him. So uh, anyway, I, that, so, but that 18% number is still crops up. I saw it last year two times uh, at various things I went to and I'm like, Oh, that's embarrassing. You're showing false data. But anyway, we're going to educate you to the real data today. Uh, so Frank Mifflinger, he's done uh, uh, research and calculations, and his estimate is that in the United States, uh, the livestock in the United States are responsible for about 3.4 percent of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. You can see how that compares to all of agriculture and to the transportation industry. Uh, so, so according to the FAO, some uh, major categories of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, I won't read, read these to you, you can read them yourself, I assume. Uh, but anyway, a number of different categories here where greenhouse gases uh, come from. A uh, couple of points that we'll come back and talk some more about later. Uh, we have enteric fermentation and respiration, so this is going to be coming from the rumen. Uh, those microbes in the rumen produce uh, methane and they er the cows eructate and it goes into the environment. Uh, animal manure, uh, we're gonna come back and talk about this and how we're capturing some of this methane later on. And then, excuse me, we have livestock related land use changes. So what this is referring to is uh, when you're taking uh, forests and turning it into land that's being used for forests or jungles and turning it into land that's being used for animal production. Uh, and then you can read through through the others there. One thing I want to point out here is that in the United States we are no longer taking land, taking forests and turning it into agriculture or animal produced lands. Uh, there are other countries that, that are still doing that. We did that in the United States 200 years ago. And we're actually now reforesting and putting land, more land into forests. It is kind of hypocritical of us, though, to point at other countries and say, uh, you can't do what we did 200 years ago. Uh, I, I think it's important that we work with them to come up with solutions so that they can have the, the same revolution and, and or, uh, industrial revolution that we had in, in ways that are sustainable and work for them. We can talk more about that later. Anyway, point is in the United States, we don't have that uh, factor affecting our greenhouse gas emissions of taking 
trees and other carbon sinks and turning it into to livestock production. All right, this slide is, uh, it looks at the, the effect of dairy production on the environmental impact. Uh, most of that in production, that impact on the environment is gonna occur on the farm. Uh, this is from Jude Capper, another person that I've met and heard speak a number of times. Uh, so kind of interesting to look at. Uh, about 51% of, of the environmental impact is gonna come from milk, the actual producing of the milk, 20% from feed, and you can see the other numbers there. Uh, similar uh, with uh, beef production, uh, Jude Capper followed up her dairy research with beef research and uh, showed uh, that, again, a lot of that environmental impact is going to happen on the farm. So anything we can do on the farm to mitigate that is going to be beneficial. Uh, the other interesting thing that Jude showed was that there was a, a negative correlation that exists between milk yield and the carbon footprint. Uh, so in countries uh, in North America and Western Europe where we have high milk yield, we also have a lower uh, carbon footprint in terms of kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram uh, of milk. Uh, whereas if we compare these to other countries, uh, Asian countries and African countries, uh, the carbon footprint per kilogram of milk is higher uh, as, they, as they decrease in terms of milk yield. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this and talk about this some more and about why that is uh, later on. Uh, so this slide again shows you milk production in the United States uh, compared to uh, other countries. Uh, we'll, come, we'll talk more about this in a bit. One of the things to keep in mind as we look at the environmental impact of uh, meat and milk consumption is that uh, the functional unit is either meat consumed or milk consumed. Consumers don't go to the store and buy a cow and bring a cow home. Uh, they go to the store and buy a gallon of milk or they buy a pound of meat or five pounds of meat, five pounds of hamburger. So when we look at the environmental impact, it's important to look at the functional unit that the consumers actually consume or uh, purchase. And that's important because if we look at the dairy industry, uh, we're gonna compare 1944 to 2007. I'll tell you more about why that is here in just a minute. Uh, but if you look at the carbon footprint per cow, uh, it's uh, doubled per cow uh, since 1944. Uh, part of that's because we're getting more milk per cow and so they also have to eat more feed to support all that milk production. Uh, more about that in a minute. The carbon footprint per kilogram of milk produced has decreased by two thirds. So we've made, had a 66% reduction in our carbon footprint per kilogram of milk. So the US dairy farm industries reduced its total carbon footprint by 41% since 1944. Uh, one of the challenges we have with uh, milk production and all food production is producing a safe, sufficient, affordable supply of food for consumers. And sometimes people get hung up and think that we're doing things all wrong. But if you look at the history of the world, we have the most abundant, abundant supply of food that we've ever had in the history of the world. Uh, when we cook our hamburger, we usually pull the grease off and put it in a can and throw it away. When we cook our bacon, we do the same thing. It wasn't that long ago that people would never do that because there's so much energy in that fat and they, they're so dependent on energy as, a, as fat as a source of energy that, that that would be a terrible waste. But in our society today, we have such an abundant supply of food that we, we have an obesity problem in the, in, in the world, especially in the United States right now. And so we've done very well at coming out, producing a, an abundant supply of food for people to consume. And I think that's something that we should be happy of and proud of uh, especially more proud of than we tend to be. We also have a safe supply of food. Our food is safer than it has ever been in the history of the world. And, uh, uh, and we have a lot less occurrence of foodborne pathogens uh, being passed in outbreaks. It still happens from time to time, but uh, we've done a lot to mitigate that. Uh, I just have to say it, uh, it's be prior to the almost universal pasteurization of milk, about 30% of foodborne pathogens came from dairy products. Since we started pasteurizing milk, less than 1% of illness from food uh, comes from milk. Anyway, 
I'm getting off topic, sorry. Uh, another important thing to point out to you is that uh, the USDA does recommend that we consume milk and meat as part of a healthy diet. Uh, milk and meat are an important source of high quality protein, uh, minerals and vitamins, and also essential fatty acids. Uh, one of the things I really harp on my students on is drinking soda or even worse is energy drinks. When you compare the nutrition in milk to the nutrition in an energy drink, the energy drink's gonna give you caffeine and junk and sugar, and uh, the milk's gonna give you minerals, vitamins, potassium, calcium, protein. Again, I'm getting off topic, but anyway, uh, milk is in, and meat are an important part of a diet. In the United States, the United States is a leading producer of milk, beef, chicken, and poultry, as well as pork, eggs, and game meat. So if the United States were to all of a sudden stop producing meat, uh, there'd be, it would contribute to a food shortage. Um, many of you probably know about the population growth and the amount of food that's gonna be required to feed people in the year 2050. Uh, it's projected that we'll have over 9 billion people in the world to feed. Uh, the other thing that contributes to our demand for feed, or for, excuse me, you're human, so it's food, uh, excuse me. Uh, the demand for food is going to be uh, that, uh, as, as third world countries continue to develop, they're going to have a higher demand. As countries develop, there's a higher demand for protein, for animal protein in their diets. And uh, so it's estimated actually that between the year 2000 and the year 2050, there's gonna be as much food supply requirement as there was in the total history of man previous to the year 2000. That's, that's kind of a little bit overwhelming, but it's also something that, that makes it exciting to be part of the food industry and to be part of that production. So I mentioned a little bit about 1944 compared to 2007. Again, this is research from Jude Capper. I, she looked at comparing 1944 to 2007. And when I first saw this, saw this I wondered why she picked 1944. Uh, but then as I thought about it, it made a whole lot of sense. If you think about 1944 in terms of the history of the world, uh, this is right after World War II, uh, not long after the Great Depression. And there was a lot of uh, push. People wanted, uh, as I said, an abundant supply of food and they'd been hungry. And so there was a lot of research, a lot of uh, incentive for, for producing an abundant supply of food. Uh, and there's another reason why 1944 is significant that I'll mention in just a minute. Uh, so if we look at the dairy, this one specifically looks at the dairy industry. I, back in 1944, we had 25 million cows. Compared to 2007, there's just 9.2 million cows. Uh, these 26 million cows were producing 53 billion kilograms of milk. With 9 million cows, we're producing 84 billion kilograms of milk. Uh, in 1944, we had a lot more diversity in terms of breeds of dairy cows. 54% uh, of the dairy herd was Jersey, Guernsey, or Ayrshire, what we call the color breeds. Uh, again, we're gonna get into a little bit of lecture for you. Uh, Holsteins, uh, as a breed, produced the highest quantity of milk per cow. And so after 1944, there was kind of a shift to, to Holsteins. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up on a Jersey farm. Uh, Jersey's uh, we get a higher production of uh, butter and cheese from Jersey milk because it's higher in fat and protein. Uh, and actually, I'm proud to say that over the last uh, probably 10 to 20 years, uh, it used to be Holsteins were about 90% of the dairy herd. That's decreased now or to where uh, it's only, Holsteins are only about 80% of the dairy herd in the United States. And there's a lot more Jerseys. We found that Jerseys are more efficient and that per pound of feed consumed, they produce more milk. So even though Holsteins get more milk per cow, Jerseys get more milk per pound of feed, which is also an environmental consideration as we'll see here in just a bit. Uh, another thing that was rare in 1944 was artificial insemination. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with that term. I remember one time in college, I was sitting at dinner with my roommates and they started talking about AI. My roommates were engineers and AI to them is something totally different than it is for me. Uh, AI to me means artificial insemination, which is uh, taking semen from a bowl and freezing it 
And uh, you can use uh, one bull to breed hundreds of cows now instead of just 25 uh, back in, as compared to 1944. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I showed you the ingredients of our TMR or total mixed ration uh, that we use today. Uh, back in 1944, there's a lot more pasture uh, with 40% uh, of dry matter intake coming from pasture and, uh, and, and a lot more grass being fed back then. So as we compare uh, the milk production today to 1944, I put 100% as being the level for each of these in uh, 1944. Our milk production per cow is 443% uh, of what it was in 1944, which is I think is a pretty impressive uh, that we've made that kind of gain in terms of milk production per cow. Because we get more milk per cow, we need fewer animals to produce milk. So we only use 21% of the animals that were used in 1944. With fewer animals, it requires less feed and less water and co consequently less land. And when you have fewer animals, you also get less manure production, which means you also have less greenhouse gas emissions and a smaller carbon footprint. I am curious if anybody knows of any industries that have had the same comparable reduction in their carbon footprint as the dairy industry. We've reduced our uh, carbon footprint by 41% since 1944. I don't know if any other industry had, can say that or not, but I'm pretty proud of the dairy industry. Beef industry, uh, so the numbers that we have here, uh, the data available only went back to 1977. Uh, so it's not as dramatic, but a part of that's because there's 30 years less in terms of improvement here. Uh, but uh, beef per animal is 31% more. And again, fewer animals, less feed water and land required to feed those animals with also less manure, methane and nitrogen production. I gotta pick up the pace a little bit. We're gonna run out of time. I've been talking too much. Uh, anyway, uh, so some of the reasons why that happened, uh, is improved nutrition for the animals. We know what their requirements are and so we're be better able to feed them. Uh, I mentioned another important date related to 1944. In 1945, the first publication of the nutrient requirements of dairy cattle was published by the National, National Research Council. There's also nutrient requirements published for beef, for swine, for small ruminants, for dogs, for cats. Um, anyway, uh, these get revised every few years. Uh, the last one came out in 2001 when I was an undergraduate at Utah State University. It was pretty exciting to have a brand new NRC. It's amazing how fast time flies and now we're anxiously awaiting the next NRC to be published. Uh, but anyway, uh, we know better how to feed our animals is one reason why we're getting more milk production per cow. Uh, other things that have improved our efficiency is also production uh, per acre in terms of corn and soybean. And also genetic improvement. As I said, uh, we can select a genetically superior bull and breed, uh, well, not all of the cows, but hundreds of cows to that bull. And uh, then if they, they're genetically superior in terms of milk production, then also their uh, offspring are going to be genetic, uh, hopefully genetically superior in terms of milk production. I think Dr. Shedlaskis is on this uh, Zoom meeting. She could teach you a whole lot more about genetics and reproduction. Uh, she's our repro teacher at Delaware Valley University. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, through that genetic improvement, we've also been able to increase milk production per cow in the United States. Why is that important in terms of the environment? If you think about a cow versus your car, uh, back when we used to drive to work, uh, you drive your car and that would have an energy requirement, but when you got home and turned your car off at night, your car no longer had an energy requirement. Cows and all animals have what we call a maintenance energy requirement. So even when the cow lays down uh, for the night and is resting, they're going to have an energy requirement. That's what we call the maintenance energy requirement. So if a cow is producing only seven kilograms of milk, then 69% of their energy requirement is gonna be going towards their maintenance energy and 31% of their energy is going to be going towards milk production. Whereas if we look at a cow producing 29 kilograms of milk, then 10%, uh, excuse me, 
33% of her energy requirement is going to be used for maintenance energy requirement and 67% of her energy is going to be used for milk and so we're getting a lot better efficiency here and as uh, it takes land and it takes uh, feed and it takes water to produce that milk efficiency is a desirable thing in terms of the effects on the environment. Uh, the same thing happens with um, beef production uh, whereas uh, again comparing 1977 to 2007 uh, the maintenance requirement for average beef in 1977 was 53%, and now it's in 2007 had been reduced to 45%. I mentioned alternative feeds or co-products earlier. Uh, another big one uh, that was fed, especially a few years ago when ethanol industry was booming, we had a lot of what we call corn distillers grain, which is a byproduct of the ethanol industry that we were feeding to uh, uh, to dairy cows, to beef cows, to swine, uh, and even to poultry as well. And so a number of different things have advanced our ability to efficiently feed animals, including increasing the digestibility of the feeds that we feed them. Um, I'm running out of time, so we're going to go fairly quickly through some of these slides. I, compared to 1977, in 1977 it took five cows to produce the same amount of meat that four cows produce today. So that's interesting to look at. And again, fewer cows means less feed and less manure. Uh, we'll skip through this slide. This is a good slide for my students to think about how they can further improve e efficiency. Uh, some of you probably aren't gonna be concerned about that. One thing I wanted to mention was methane digesters is uh, one way that we've uh, approached to capture the methane that comes from the manure. Uh, in the United States, uh, we have fairly expensive methane digesters. Uh, but they, they work out pretty well. Uh, one of the dairies I take my students to see out in Lebanon County uh, has about 800 cows on the farm. They have a methane digestion. They capture from that manure uh, enough energy to, uh, to power 120 houses. Uh, 120 of their neighbors are, are powered by energy from the manure uh, that's captured from these methane digesters from, from the manure that animals produce. Uh, earlier this year in uh, January, uh, before uh, you know what happened, uh, I was able to go to Costa Rica and uh, while I was there I saw uh, some fairly simple methane digesters that they had there. I thought this was interesting. I don't know if it's something uh, that would be safe or how safe these are or if it's something we could, there, if we're too regulated in the United States to actually implement these, but it was kind of interesting to look at these more simple uh, methane digesters where they attempt to capture that methane that's released from uh, from manure production. Uh, one more thing, or maybe two more things that I want to talk about. A lot of times we have uh, this idealistic picture of happy cows being uh, out on the pasture, consuming pasture. Uh, there's a number of, there's some research on in terms of animal welfare. Uh, if you're interested in looking more about that, I've talked about too many tangents already, uh, but uh, can, especially uh, in Canada, they've done a lot of research uh, on animal welfare and whether they prefer being on the pasture or in the barn. Uh, part of the answer is it depends on the weather, uh, whether they'd be out on the pasture or not. But when we look at, as far as an environmental perspective, uh, there's uh, three erroneous assumptions if you're thinking that pasture is more friendly than, uh, more environmentally friendly than feeding them uh, TMR or total mixed ration inside of a, a barn. Uh, one is that cows or animals that are out on pasture are also going to have a higher energy requirement because they have to walk around and uh, harvest that feed for themselves. Uh, it uh, takes them longer to get to finishing. I'll show you that slide, some more data on that in just a second. And then uh, that they, they have the same greenhouse gas emissions from fermentation. And that is also not correct and that gets back to our volatile fatty acids that I'll mention in just a minute. Uh, we're not going to go through all these numbers but this compares corn fed cattle to pasture fed cattle. They start at the same weight and end at the same weight. If you look at the finishing period how many days the corn fed cattle are almost or let's say they're 201 days shorter than the pasture fed cattle so less time on feed. And if you come down here and look at uh, energy requirement, uh, this is megajoules per kilogram of gain. 
It's much smaller for the corn-fed animals, and our methane production is much less for the corn-fed animals as well. Uh, one of the reasons why the methane production is less is because, as I mentioned earlier, those microbes inside the cow's uh, rumen, or the first stomach compartment, are producing volatile fatty acids. Those volatile fatty acids, I sure hope you know these, Cassie, are uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Uh, when we have a higher grain diet that we feed to the animals, then there's more propionate production. Propionate is a three carbon fatty acid. Propionate can be used for glucose synthesis. So when we get more propionate production, we also have more energy available for the cow to produce milk or to produce meat or put some uh, marbling into our meat. Uh, when we feed a higher forage diet or a higher a, a pasture-based diet, then we're going to get more acetate production. Acetate is a two carbon fatty acid uh, and acetate is used for uh, fat production. So actually when we feed a higher forage diet, we get more uh, fat in our milk, uh, which is, that might seem like a negative thing, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, a higher fat milk means that we can also get more cheese or butter from that milk. It also means that, that you get more of the healthy fat. So if you go to the grocery store and look at Horizon is one of the big organic brands, they feed their cows on pasture because they're getting a higher forage diet, they're also getting higher acetate production, and that acetate is gonna mean there's more fat. And there's healthy fats such as omega-3 fats, and so when they claim that they're higher in omega-3 fats, that, that, that makes sense, that they have higher fats because they're getting a higher fat level, they're also getting higher level of the healthy fats such as the omega-3 fats or conjugated linoleic acid. Uh, and we could have a whole other lecture about that another day, but anyway. Um, but also when we get higher acetate production, we get higher methane production. As I said, acetate is a two carbon fatty acid, propionate is a three carbon fatty acid. So when we get more acetate production, we need another hydro, or excuse me, another carbon sink. And that carbon is put into methane. And so we get higher methane production when we have a higher forage diet. And if you think back to that slide I showed you earlier where there's a negative correlation between carbon uh, the carbon footprint and milk production, a lot of those third world countries, not are, only are they feeding more forage to their animals, but they're also gonna be feeding a poorer quality forage. Uh, this slide uh, looks at, uh, there, there's a number of places where they produce uh, pasture fed cattle, where they're also trying to decrease the amount of methane produced from those pasture fed cattle. Uh, and uh, the higher quality forage you feed, the more digestible it's going to be and also the less uh, methane production you're going to get from those animals. So that's one reason why our third world countries have a larger carbon footprint is because they're not, they're feeding some poor quality forages. And uh, not to pick on anybody, but there is a country where there's a lot of uh, worshipping of cows where they just let the cows warm, roam free and those cows are probably going to be eating some really trashy forage and so they're probably going to be producing a lot of methane. Uh, having a major environmental impact that way. And I just want to say it's not really an option for cows to just quit uh, belching that methane out into the atmosphere. Uh, it's important that they be able to eructate and get that methane out of them. Otherwise, they will bloat and their rumen will fill up and that will put pressure on their diaphragm and they won't be able to breathe and they'll die. Uh, so uh, they do need to keep uh, belching methane out of them. We're running out of time. I mentioned earlier the beta-1,4 bond uh, that's in cellulose that we are unable to break. Cows and the microbes, as hopefully you know now, can break down uh, that beta-1,4 bond and harvest the glucose from it. And so because of that, our animals are able to harvest byproducts and other plant material that would in, be indigestible to us and turn it into a high quality meat and milk product. So in conclusion, animal protein is an important part of a human diet. Demand will continue to increase for uh, animal protein. Uh, we have improved efficiency uh, and uh, in so doing, we've also had an improvement on the environmental impact. And it's important that we meet the requirement for, uh, for consumption and at the same time improve our in environmental stewardship through modern agriculture techniques.
And with that, I'll take any questions. There's my email too, if you want to email me questions later on. There's a picture of our cows at the Del Val Dairy eating their total mixed ration. All right, so let me stop share and go to the question and answer. All right, is spent pear mash also used as a cattle feed component? Yes, uh, we call that uh, distiller, no, not distiller's grain, brewer's grain, brewer's grain. And yes, uh, we use brewer's grain uh, is, is, a, is a legitimate feed to use. Uh, one of the issues is that sometimes it's wet and uh, and so uh, drying it becomes an issue that an expense, uh, I, I'm getting a little off tangent, but right now uh, we have a faculty on at Del Val that's making rye whiskey and uh, wants us to use the, the, the byproduct rye as a source of feed for our cows, but transporting it because it's still wet is an issue. But anyway, as yes, uh, spent beer mash can be used as a cattle feed component. Uh, the next question, I've been drinking skim milk for decades, but had the feeling that my dairy farmer friends would rather I drink whole milk, why? I, well, I would say we're glad you're drinking milk, whether it's skim milk or whole milk, uh, but there is some research that whole milk uh, there, as I mentioned, there are some healthy fats in milk, and so there, there's been some indication that uh, whole milk, uh, it, 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 there is some health benefits to whole milk. Uh, a lot of times fat gets a negative uh, reputation. Uh, it's important to know that there's different types of fat, and milk fat tends to be a healthy fat and have more of the healthy fats in it, such as CLA and DHA uh, that, that, that could be out there. Uh, whereas your trans fats are going to be the more of the fats that are unhealthy fats and fats that you want to avoid. And so uh, th th there is some, some pretty good research that the whole milk does have some health benefits to it. But I would also say that you need to look at your whole diet as well. Uh, most of us get plenty of energy without drinking whole milk. And so even though it's a healthy fat, you might be getting healthy fats from other things in your diets as well. And so maybe whole milk's not the best choice for you. Uh, is there any danger of a breed specific disease that could wipe out the Holstein herd? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, one of the bigger things that uh, we're seeing is inbreeding being an issue because as we've bred all of our cows to the same superior bulls, uh, the dairy herd is very much related in the United States. And uh, of course we know what happens, some of you know what happens with you breed cousins to cousins. And so we've been importing bulls from other countries and starting to get some of their superior genetics into our herd as well. Uh, and there are breed specific diseases out there. Uh, and so uh, that, that could be a legitimate concern. Uh, usually, uh, so I mentioned breed specific diseases, a lot of times we identify those uh, and, and are able to select against them uh, in, in terms of breeding. And also uh, genomics is another thing that's becoming more and more popular where we can identify the whole uh, genome uh, of the cows and uh, select for traits and try and not select for some of those breed specific uh, diseases that could happen through genetics. But, but it is a legitimate question and a good question. Cassie, uh, do you think that the 18% of the initial study is the main reason for the blame of animals on the environment or do you think that there are other uh, factors at play? No, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, there is an environmental impact of, of, of consuming animals. And if you look at even uh, Frank Mifflin's uh, numbers, uh, if you look at total agriculture production, it was uh, like 5.4% and animal production is 3.4. That's a big part of that total uh, production uh, that is coming from animals. And so compared to a plant-based diet, yes, there is, uh, I have to say, a, a bigger environmental impact. Uh, but I do think that the 18%, especially the people that I hear really harping on it, they quote that 18% and it's just not accurate and it's not correct. And I think it's also worth pointing out the advancements that we have made uh, in, in, in animal production. As, as I've just shown you that I, I don't know of any under, other industry that's made those type of advancements. And it, it's going around Facebook a lot right now, but the, People point out that with our current uh, pandemic going on, people have stopped driving, the environment's getting a lot cleaner, but guess what? All the cows are still here. 
Uh, we're still milking cows and still uh, getting meat from cows. I don't want to go too far down that road because there are some problems happening with that right now. But anyway, uh, so I, I think I've answered your question that, that there are probably some other things. And yes, I, I will not deny that meat production, meat consumption is still a higher environmental impact than plants. It's just not as high as a lot of people think it is. Uh, the next question, I'm not sure if this Molly's from my class or not, but anyway, uh, will there be even more of a reduction of emissions from cows in the near future as there was between 1944 and 2007? Uh, yeah, as we continue to advance and uh, get new technologies and new ways of improving efficiency, I think there will continue to be an improvement. Uh, there's research in ways to increase digestibility of our feed where we're getting more energy out of the feed. So again, we have, there's less feed that is required to feed to the animals. Uh, and so that consequently less manure if they're getting increasing digestibility. Uh, and uh, hmm, I don't know if I even want to mention this, but there was a tool we had a few years ago that really increased milk production uh, called recumbent bovine somatotrophin, RBST. Uh, I, if you look at your milk, it's probably going to say made from cows not treated with RBST. Pretty much we've had to quit using it because consumers demanded it. And if that's what consumers want, that's fine. But when we increase our efficiency, when we get more milk production per cow, it has a huge environmental impact too. And so by not using RBST, uh, we are decreasing our efficiency and also requiring more feed to produce the same amount of milk, producing more manure and manure methane. Again, there's pros and cons, and we could talk more about that another day. But uh, the reality is that not using tools like that is going to have an environmental effect. Uh, products called milk, like almond, almond juice and vegetable meats, my opinion. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of controversy over these. I, I've looked at the nutrition labels of uh, such things as almond uh, juice and uh, coconut juice and things like that, and they don't have the same type of nutrition, the same amount of protein or calcium in them. Uh, but for some people, some people are lactose intolerant and some people need an alternative. And so I'm glad that people have the choice and uh, have options out there, but I don't think they provide the same nutrition. And I'm really looking for, I, 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 I'm interested to see the environmental impact because if you look at the ingredients of milk and how locally grown milk is, especially here in Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania's the fifth or sixth largest, we just switched, and I think we switched back and forth, but about the fifth or sixth largest dairy producing state in the country. And uh, and, and so it's it's local thing. A lot of those ingredients such as coconut milk or almonds, we don't grow here in Pennsylvania. And so uh, that's gonna have an environmental impact in terms of transporting it here. Uh, vegetables, I, I, again, I think there's going to be a lot of ingredients in those, and I don't think that they're in as, I, I, again, I, I haven't seen a report or a study. I should research that some more, uh, but comparing vegetable meat to uh, real meat, I, I think you're going to have a lot more negative environmental impact from those vegetable meats uh, in them. And then I have a thank you. This was great info. You're welcome. I hope it was useful and beneficial. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, feel free to email me as well if you want to finish the or finish the continue the conversation. I'll put my email back up there. Appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon to join me. Uh, I enjoyed it, and uh, and uh, and have a good afternoon. I think that's everything.